Uh, Scott, let's start with you. Hey, Scott, can you hear me over in the western part of North Carolina? Hi there. Yes, from the Piedmont, as we say in North Carolina. <laughs> That's I'm right. Happy to be here. Happy to be Thank here you. and excited Fantastic. about uh, the evening. Well, Scott, let me let me put you on pause just for a moment, and Barbara, let me bring you forward and, and uh, greet you, I Barbara. Greet you, you, Barbara. Barbara you're 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 here. Here. Yes, I am. I'm very great to be here. How's everybody doing? We're doing great. Thank We're doing you. We're doing great. Thank um, you. Um, Barbara, I have a little, Barbara, bit, of have a little bit of echo and feedback, and I wonder we're going to take, take this quick sidebar. I wonder if you've got some earbuds, 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 or earbuds, or earbuds that, you can, that you can use. I can. Hold on. I'm going to mute myself. Fantastic. And while she's muted, Scott, I'm going to give the uh, the slide deck to you and invite you to start the conversation. As the moderator, again, I'll bring questions forward. I'll be monitoring the chat box. And at different points, we'll pause and we'll bring the audience uh, into the conversation. So, Scott, uh, thank you for joining us. We, we're very better? anxious to hear your story. Uh, hello, Barbara. Hello. It is. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, hi, all. So we're starting um, with this question, who we are and why we're here. And I'm coming to you as a teacher in German literary and cultural studies with a real emphasis on cultural history from a small liberal arts college in North Carolina. Um, but I'm also coming to you as somebody who grew up in the Southern Appalachians, not far from McMinn County, Tennessee, which we'll talk about here after a while. Um, and um, Barbara and I met because of McMinn County, Tennessee. So maybe Barbara, you can carry on from there and then we'll get to what happened in last January. Sure, thanks Scott. So um, so my name is Barbara Mann. I, I teach comparative literature, and modern Hebrew and Yiddish literature at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City. And you know, Scott and I, as we've been talking uh, over the last weeks and months about this evening, we really wanted it to be kind of a continuation of the conversation that he and I have been having uh, virtually and via Zoom. We have not yet met in person. I'm really looking forward to that at some point. Um, but I reached out to Scott when I heard about McMinn County and the banning of Mouse. Mouse is a book that I've taught for many years. I think it's a really important book. And uh, and I was just I was so outraged when I read about what had happened in McMinn County and. In the article in the Times, Scott was featured as as putting together um, an online course and, and offering mouse uh, to to high school students in the area, and I just reached out to him and said, "That's amazing." And you know, we began talking about all kinds of things, and you know, tried to collaborate on some projects. And Scott came and and spoke to to my students a couple of weeks ago. So I'm just really, I'm just really delighted to be here with him and to you know to continue this conversation with him, and with you. Um, you know, there's this is the general map for the evening. I'm going to present kind of a little bit of an introduction, just some sort of general terms and and kind of a general frame uh, for for what to, what we talk about when we talk about Holocaust literature. What does it mean? And then specifically, um, graphic novels within that great body of work. I'll introduce some some key terms for the understanding of Mouse. Um, as uh, you know, as a graphic novel in relation to the Holocaust, and then I'm going to turn it over to Scott, who will dive more sort of into the historical uh, side of things, and will also um, bring us bring us in, you know firmly into sort of the current debates about Mouse within uh, the, the sort of the wider category of book banning. I'll point out that there are prodigious prodigious resources um, for later. There are some that were for this evening. Um, but there's lots of reading there, not only about mouse and sort of, you know, things to help you think about mouse and, and teach mouse, but also a lot of background um, from Penn and from other um, news and from news outlets about what's happened with um, with book banning in the last couple of years. So, Scott, do you want to add anything before I sort of dive into dive into this initial piece? Uh, just to say, be sure and ask questions as you go, and um, yeah. that we're really hopeful that. We're really hopeful that you all will will get into the resources and then feel free to contact us, I would say, you know, that that that's, that's how Barbara and I got to know each other was just a cold call email and you know, here we are now, um, collaborators and colleagues. And so we're we're committed to that kind of um collaborative pedagogy. There we go. Lovely. Okay. So um just a kind of a you know, to sort of take it out to the macro. Um, this 
this, the macro level, this big field of Holocaust literature, um, by now an enormous field, an enormous body of work. And within that, um, that body of work, on the right side of your screen, you'll see just a, a graphic um, for a conference that was held a number of, of years ago about Holocaust comics since Mouse. So just to sort of flag for you, and I'm going to, I'll show a few examples of these, some things that I've taught with and some things that I can recommend. There's, there's a really creative body of work of, of, of comics artists who are kind of working in the wake of Mouse and in dialogue with Mouse. But first, this, you know, this category um, of Holocaust literature. Going back to uh, maybe even the beginnings, can we date it from 1949? And Theodore Adorno uh, famously said to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. And what he was pointing to there, I think, was the, sort of the ethical dilemma that we can see even in Spiegelman's text. I know that we're going to, I know that Scott's going to talk about this page in a little, a little while uh, later in the evening. But, you know, what does it mean um, to create art out of other people's suffering, right? It, you know, there's, there's, there's a kind of a barbarism. There's a kind of a, something there that, that sort of rubs the wrong way. Um, and that is it, potentially deeply unethical to, to create art from other people's suffering and then to benefit um, from the creation of that art in some fashion, either through fame or monetary gain. So I think that that, that kind of tension um, is, is kind of a question about Holocaust literature more broadly, and we, we see it really kind of thematized and addressed in the work itself, especially in mass. A little thumbnail definition there. This is from the, the What is Holocaust Literature volume that I showed the cover of just a moment ago. Um, Holocaust literature comprises all forms of writing, both documentary and discursive, and in any language that have shaped the public memory of the Holocaust and been shaped by it. So a, a very kind of capacious um, definition comprising all kinds of genres, um, and, and all kinds of languages, right? So the question of genre here um, is, is kind of a tenacious and interesting one, the connection between literature and memoir, between, between history and fiction. Um, it's almost as if the Holocaust as a set of events demands you know, this kind of treatment in multiple genres and even treatment across genres, right? Gen genres which are themselves kind of mixed or hybrid. Um, the language that Ulrich is written in, of course, determines uh, in some degree its audience. So the, you know, the first examples of Holocaust literature, the first literary texts about the Holocaust were written um, in Yiddish and in Polish and in German, later in Hebrew and English. And, and again, the sort of the, the, the point of view and the audience of these works is, is in, in large part kind of determined by that language. And I'll, I'll, I'll just mention um, you know, here the example of Elie Wiesel's uh, Night, which some of you might know, one of the more well-known works of Holocaust fiction, was originally written uh, as a Yiddish novel called Und die Welt hat ungeschweigt, and the world was silent. And then the author rewrote it or wrote a smaller version of it in French, um, and then only after that was it, was it translated into English. And so each of those books has a different kind of audience um, and a different point of view. Another, a couple more organizing categories that will bring us a little bit closer um, to mouse. Um, the question of, of testimony and witnessing and sort of the, the authority of kind of lived experience is, um, is really at the heart of a lot of the, the ways that we interact as readers with um, Holocaust fiction and Holocaust literature. So you have, again, the example of Elie Wiesel and somebody like Primo Levi who write with this kind of what, we, what I like to call sort of the moral authority of the witness. They were there, they saw it firsthand, and they're bringing us their testimony. Of course, you know, as we are, we are now in a moment when, when, when more, fewer and fewer uh, people who are actually there, either in the camps or in the war, um, are still alive to give their testimony. And so over, you know, over the years, there has emerged another equally powerful uh, cohort of writing, uh, what we call second generation writing about the Holocaust. Um, and this is uh, work that emerges from the sons and the daughters, the children of survivors. And of course, one of their great topics is the, the inherited trauma or the intergenerational trauma or how the Holocaust affects family relationships. And this really, of course, is very much at the heart of Mouse. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plunge ahead for a couple more slides, and then 
I'll just take a, a pause, okay? So just to get us, you know, a little bit closer to tonight's topic, um, what are comics? The great Scott McCloud, who has written a delightful graphic novel about comics, and I recommend it to you all, and we included um, in, the, in the webinar material and the preparation material for tonight just some pages um, that I, I have used with my students just to kind of give them um, a, a taste of the kind of vocabulary and some of the analytical terms that can be used to describe comics. So McLeod, again, gives us, um, I think, a very kind of a generous but also precise definition. What are comics? Juxtapose pictorial and other images in deliberate sequence intended to convey information and or produce an aesthetic response in the viewer. So notice how he says the aesthetic response in the viewer and not the reader. I would quibble with that a little bit, but we can talk about that. What are we doing when we read? Do we read comics? Do we view comics? I think we have to read them, actually, but that's another, that's another question. But, but here, just to, again, note the sort of the capaciousness of the definition, right? Um, conveying information, producing an aesthetic response. Comics can be about anything. What is a graphic novel? Right, so they're related terms, comics and a graphic novel. A graphic novel, it's essentially a marketing term that was coined by the great Will Eisner in 1978 to describe his book, The Contract with God. And it's a long-form comics narrative about growing up Jewish and poor in the Bronx. And Eisner, he wanted to be taken seriously. And he thought that if he called it a graphic novel and not comics, that he would, he would get some respect, that people would buy his book. And it kind of worked, um, I think, because we have, you know, with Spiegelman in 1980, and notice the sort of the proximity there um, of the years, um, the 80s were really sort of the year when the graphic novel comes into its, come, begins to emerge as a, as a kind of an art form that people take seriously. I should say, Spiegelman kind of hates this term. He sort of loathes it. He prefers, um, you know, comics to be kind of in the gutter and low brow, which is where they've always been and where they've where they where they began. Um, but you know, he didn't he didn't set out to write about the Shoah or his family experience per se. He simply wanted to produce a long form comics where readers would need a bookmark. Now I can't see what's going on in the audience chat, but I'm gonna just pause here and see um, and maybe ask Andy or see if there's there's something that we that we wanna I'm going to look at the chat also while I'm doing that. Uh, well, the good, the good news, Barbara, is that my role as the moderator is to bring you questions and comments. So you're welcome to watch it. You're also welcome to ignore it. And I'll bring you the, the greatest hits. And here are a few of them. Um, Great. This first question comes from another Barbara M. This one, though, is in Wilmington, Delaware. And Barbara's wondering how you as a scholar respond to and um, are, are – uh, accepted by uh, your peers, your colleagues, when you work in something called comics or graphic novels or cartoons? How, how does the scholarly world accept these as pieces of literature and pieces of art? I think that there's a lot of respect now for comics as, a, as an art form, is the sort of the short answer to that question. It's, it's you know, you'll sometimes, sometimes I get a raised eyebrow from my students you know, they're kind of like, well, you know, Marvel, comics, they're not quite sure what to do with it. But once you, you know, once you get them in the classroom, and for those of you who have taught with graphic novels, you know that they can be very challenging to read. So I think that, you know, as a scholar, this is, you know, comics now are kind of a part of the humanities in a really profound way. And they're taught across the humanities. They're taught in literature classes, they're taught in history classes, they're used in creative writing situations. So I think they've really arrived, I would say. Mm. I, Fantastic, I would thank agree you. With that. Good. Let me interject too there, I, that I think Please. in large part, um, Spiegelman's Pulitzer Prize um, is mm. sort of the external sign of that sort of legitimacy for for comics. But I agree completely, Barbara, that comics are are part of our part of our humanities world right now um, in in every way. And in, in some ways that I get to in my little um, you know, pre, pre video, when I talk about the relationship between text and paratext that I, that comics in a way explodes a very kind of old fashioned orthodox way of thinking about text and makes, makes shows 
how much more complicated comics can be than, say, uh, a realist novel or a, a, a sort of straight standard 19th century narrative. So in, in some ways, like you say, it's it's harder. Mm -hmm. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, this question maybe splits the difference between those two perspectives. This question comes from Dom. Dom is in Los Angeles. And uh, Dom, I'm going to paraphrase this some, so uh, please do chat me if you if you want me to, to be more, more precise. Um, but Dom is curious about the, uh, the role of the text versus the role of the graphic. Um, you know, both both are incredibly important parts of both explicit and implicit communication. Um, the ways that we read graphic novels and comics are different than the ways we might read just a straight text or something else. Talk to us a little bit about, yeah. in your opinion, in your opinion, for for Mouse, the the role of of the actual art piece versus the text. Okay. So that actually, I think, is a great segue into the next slide. I'm going to move forward great. with that and answer okay. that question. And this is just, an, so these are sort of my organizing terms for teaching mouse, the language of comics. I'm going to address each one of these in a different slide. The language of comics, testimony, narrative, holocaust, um, and then why mouse and inherited trauma. But specifically about the images, right? So when... For me, it's there's a kind of a use. I like to draw a useful distinction, and this is, it might be kind of splitting hairs, but it's helpful for me when I teach, right? That I like to talk about the language of comics as opposed to comics as a kind of a genre or a type of work, and so that allows me to to give students kind of concrete tools addressing this this sort of the specific art form that that this is. Of course, beginning with the visual, right? The relationship between image and text. Um, and, you know, there's a, a couple of other terms here that are very important. The first is to notice on the right. I don't know if you can actually see my the mouse. I see it on my screen. Can they, Andy, can they I, see my mouse I, if I'm sort of highlighting? I, I, see what, I see what you did there, Barbara. Um, no, they cannot see your mouse. That's okay. Um, That's fine. I, it's, it's not necessary. So on the yeah. right, you know, this is a two-page, a typical two-page spread from mouse. And I'm going to show you in a minute some of the a page where you see his drafting. So, you know, sometimes when we're teaching literature, you know, I have this reflexive sort of thing where I tell students, well, it doesn't matter what the author meant. You just want, you know, you want your experience of it um, as you as you absorb it as a reader. But I think in the case of Mouse, we know from Spiegelman's extensive interviews. And it's just, it, the, the journals and all of the, the sort of the material that he has made available to us in a wonderful volume called Meta Mouse, that there's not an iota of this book that isn't sort of planned and intentional in some way. So when you encounter this kind of typical two-page spread in Mouse, you'll notice the page on the right is, is what we call a kind of a normative grid. And he worked on graph paper. So this is really, there's a kind of an attention here you know, two across, three down, page after page after page. If any of you have read um, Beckel's work or Persepolis, right, this is, you might even recognize this grid from other graphic novels, but they kind of get it from Spiegelman, right? He is, is a master at this. And so at the same time, and that creates a kind of a, you know, set of expectations as you're reading that you're going to see that kind of page. But then he'll break the grid, and he'll break the grid by using the gutter, that white space that we see flowing so nicely in between panels. The great Neil Gaiman says that comics happens in the gutter, that space in the gutter where you read from panel to panel across an entire page or even across two pages at once. That gutter is there to sort of preserve, remember McLeod's definition about the sequence, the deliberate sequencing of panels and the juxtaposition. So that gutter is there to allow you, the reader, to make sense of what it is that you are reading. And you'll notice in the page on the left, it's not a grid. It doesn't have the two up and the three down. And he's given you also a kind of, in addition to the panels themselves, he's given you all these other, Spiegelman has given you all these other ways of framing, right? There's the windows on the train, and then there's the, the little bridge, the arches. Those are also kinds of mini frames. So all of this, you know, this kind of play with, with different frames and with the grid, it gives a kind of sense of depth to the page. 
And this is a kind of a visual cue, and this goes directly to the question that was asked about the specific, you know, the hand, what we call the hand of the artist, right? Graphic novels are produced by a singular, a single person, not like comics historically, which were produced in collaboration, teams of people. This is one person's story drawing everything. And so it's a, there's a kind of a visual cue here for a kind of a historical depth, right? For, um, for memory, right? For the gap between the telling of the story, between his father Vladek's memories in the past and the telling of the story in the present. So all of these are, are intertwined on the page. And the way to get into that, I think, with students is just to ask them to notice these things, to give them this language, to explain to them what a grid is, what a panel is, what the gutter is, to talk to them about the different fonts and the different kinds of the, the styles of the different drawings, and give them that language and then just ask them to notice things on the page. Um, you know, Spiegelman himself, um, this is a very early comic strip of his um, where he kind of reflects on how he became an artist. And there's really, um, I can't think of another artist that I've ever encountered who's, who's so uh, um, self-aware and able to articulate um, you know, how his work has evolved and what he's doing. So in this comic strip, this is Art and Vladek. You might not m recognize them without their mouse masks, right? But this is the young, young Art, and his father, he's reading his comic book, and his father is instructing him, teaching him how to pack, because, in fact, um, you know, you're going to have to run away at some point. So you need to know how to pack a suitcase. In the bottom left frame there, he says, it's important to know to pack. Many times I had to run with only what I can carry. You have to use what little space you have to pack inside everything what you can. And then the art figure, who has now put on um, a comics character face, says, this was the best advice I've ever gotten as a cartoonist. So, so you see in this, this strip, right, um, a kind of a comment on the language of comics as um, a kind of an econ what I like to call an economy of means. Very efficient. Every detail on the page has meaning and is placed there for a reason. And so this is just one page from uh, MetaMouse, an example of, of, Spie of Spiegelman's um, his notebooks. And at the top, you'll see that yellow page, which is a, a transcript from the tapes that he used to record his father's voice. I think Scott included a little bit of one of those um, recordings in the webinar material. So you can listen to that, right? The heart of Mouse is Art interviewing his father. And then he transcribed that, um, that testimony onto the yellow piece of paper, and he sort of chunked it out into pieces of text and began to kind of plot it on, um, you know, on, on different images. So it's a, it's a very kind of a careful, um, a very kind of a careful and methodical process. Okay. But, I'm excuse just me, Professor. But, time. Do we need to stop? That's yeah, okay. Please. Yep. Professor, thank you. And I'll, I'll definitely also watch the time for us as the moderator. I'm Professor, I do have yeah. one question that's come in I'd like to address before we move on. This comes please. from our friend, our friend Jeremy in Los Angeles uh, Unified School District. He noted uh, the term interge intergenerational trauma, and he, and he thought that was a pretty elegant term. Can you talk just a little bit more about uh, that term and the way that you use it? So I'm going to bring up this slide. Um, I call it here inherited trauma. You can call it intergenerational trauma. And I think, you know, if I had to answer the question of why it is important to teach mouse now more than ever, um, I think it would have to do with this term, because uh, again, the mouse is to say that mouse is about the Holocaust is sort of a lim I think limiting actually, um, and at the heart of it is this relationship between Art Spiegelman, between Art the son, and his father Vladek, who um, is a survivor of Auschwitz and and also has a, had a rich life in Poland before the war, and and it's really Art's story. In other words, it's his story of how he comes to terms with his father's past and the effect of his father's trauma on him as a child. And, and, we, and we know now, you know, that there's, this is not um, exclusive to uh, children of Holocaust survivors, right? There's a, there's a whole field of, um, 
uh, epigenetics that that sort of studies the the way on the level of, of, of chromosomal damage that children of parents who have experienced trauma are traumatized themselves in some way. In other words, it's, it's not that the parent's trauma travels, um, and not just in terms of, you know, maybe behaviors in the household or, you know, kind of secrets in the household or other kinds of eating disorders we know among survivors, but there's a, again, there's a kind of an epigenetic chromosomal, um, I'm not pronouncing that word correctly, epigenetic I've got. Um, it's on the level of the chromosome that there's damage that done that travels to the second and to the third generation. And so when I think about, and, and, I'm, and in this particular slide, um, this image from the book, this is the interaction between Vladek and Art. After Vladek uh, discovers prisoner from uh, from the hell from the hell planet, which is the original comic that Spiegelman wrote in the wake of his mother's suicide, and he has never showed it to his father. And his father his father finds it in the house. And Mala, who is his, uh, Vladik's second wife, tells Art. He says, you know, Vladik saw that comic that you drew about Mala and about um, Anya, your mother, and her suicide. And and in this exchange, and I'll and I'll just mention. I know that Scott's going to get to this, but. Apparently, Prisoner from the Hell Planet, that was the comic that sent the McMinn County Board over the edge. That was the part of the book that they could not deal with. But you see on this page, um, Art is really nervous, and he says, well, you know, I'm sorry, Dad. I, I, didn't, I didn't want you to see that. I didn't know. And Vladek says, it's good that you got it. This is um, in the second, sort of the third set of panels down on the right. It's good you got it out of your system, but for me, it brought in my head so much memories of Anya. So that moment of empathy is extraordinary. Where Vladek says to Art, it's okay because I know that you have suffered because of my trauma. And it's this extraordinary moment of compassion. And that is why we should read Mouse now, because our students need compassion. <laughs> Sorry, that was long-winded. Yeah, wow, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm I'm not going to go back. I'll just I'll mention I'll go back just a couple of slides. This is um, this idea of testimony and narrative. I am mindful of the time. I talk about this in the in the pre in the pre webinar. It's a short film of my analysis of this page, and just to, again to sort of help students track the way the body, for example, is broken apart over the panels here, um, and then in this store in this. Um, sort of key, I think, again, another kind of key image where um, we get Spiegelman, again, he is his own best reader, yes? He says, and he gives his own definition um, of a comic strip. My, defi my dictionary defines comic strip as a narrative series of cartoons. A narrative is defined as a story. Most definitions of story leave me cold, except the one that says a complete horizontal division of a building. So just, just to notice here, um, and again, I, I have this in my in the, the the recorded video. Here's Vladek up at the top, and at the bottom, he's still on the bike narrating. But Spiegelman here, he's kind of drawing our attention to the the connection between story in narrative terms, or in terms of time, and story in terms of architecture and space. And that again is sort of the unique thing that comics does. It gives us time and space all at once. And that's why they are so hard to read. In other words, it's not just the visual and the textual, but it's the, the time and the space. I'll just I'll briefly mention, and then I'm going to pause one more time, just a few examples of other comics um, that are connected to the Holocaust that might be of use for you in the classroom. Uh, Magneto was a part of the X-Men uh, series and featured in the Marvel films. He's been given Early on, he was given a, a little bit of a hint of a backstory as a survivor of the camps, um, and then finally in the early 2000s, um, they, they, they did a true backstory of his childhood as a child Max in the camps. And you can see that um, the artists are really indebted. This is a, a slide from Magneto, um, and on your left, uh, a picture from the very early pages of volume two of Mouse, um, and you can see this sort of the visual um, indebtedness um, this kind of the, the figure of the survivor or the traumatized child in relation to the, the kind of the bulk of history. Another couple of ones that, that people might not have heard of, 
um, on the right, Anne Frank, of course, but there is a, a graphic novel a version of the diary. Um, I'll have something later to say about Anne Frank and Mouse if we have time. Um, on the left, we want to see Auschwitz about a pair of French brothers who visit Poland and are determined not to see Auschwitz. They only want to see Poland, um, you know, sort of what it's like today. And then finally, um, on the left, the wonderful Nora Krug. This is a fabulous, fabulous, such an interesting, this, I know this connects with Scott's work in really interesting ways, uh, a, a German Amer young German-American woman kind of reckoning with the Nazi past of her, old, of her own family and, and traveling back to Germany and um, you know, working through archives and flea markets and really gathering. It's a remarkable, remarkable um, piece of work. And Nora Krug already also illustrated a graphic novel version of Timothy Snyder's On Tyranny. So she's a super talented artist, and this is a very interesting book. And Miriam Caton also has, has written. So here we are. Why Mouse? And I'm going to pause, but I know that Scott is ready to come in. Thank you so much, so, Professor Mann. Andy, Andy, uh, unless I, I, you want to bring some more questions, I think you know maybe it's time for Scott. Yep. So I, I do have one question for you before we transition to Professor Dunham. Please. Um, this question comes from Bernadette. Bernadette's in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and notes that uh, while while Mouse won awards for best work of fiction, Spiegelman has often said that calling it fiction was unsettling to him. How do you bridge the question of Mouse's fiction or nonfiction? in your own teaching and classes and scholarship. Do you have any helpful hints for our audience in navigating that conversation? That's a great, that's a super great question. Um, I think in, you know, in terms of, in terms of comics per se, I think it is really important to just explain to students that because it's comics doesn't mean it's made up, you know, because they, they're so, they're so sort of, um, you know, used to, to seeing these these films, you know, the Marvel films where they have the superpowers and the, you know, so to just try to, you know, introduce them to, I think that, and I think that Scott is going to get to this, to show them the enormous kind of historical depth to, to the novel, to Mouse. In other words, it is his story. Um, it's art story. Um, but it, but you can really learn about the Holocaust, about the history of the war from it. You know, but it but it is also a stylized narrative. And again, Spiegelman has spoken, I think, very eloquently about things things that he needed to change. For example, when the book was published in Polish, and then also when the book was published in Hebrew, there were certain things that needed to be altered um, in the text. So just to kind of you know allow students to to think of it as a, as a, like kind of on a spectrum, like on a sliding scale, and not to get sort of too wrapped up in did this happen or didn't that happen. That yeah, in some ways that's a good. That's fantastic. In some ways, that's a good reminder uh, for all, for all of us who who study history. You know, the, the the past is gone. History is 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 not coming back. But what we do attempt to do is uh, create some kind of facsimile uh, using evidence and using narrative. Um, so it's there, there's never a snapshot that we're looking at. And you know, that level of of, of threading that needle seems to be an important one. Professor Mann, thank you for that uh, those introductory uh, segment. We're going to now turn to Professor Denham. Great. Um, thank you. I think with respect to that wonderful question about fiction, it might point to the fact that the Pulitzer Prize categories are inadequate. Um, many would call uh, this, and I mentioned this in my, my little video um, for preparation for the webinar, life writing. And, you know, life writing, we know from different kinds of, of testimony, will change over time as memories change over time. That doesn't that does not negate the fact that these stories are are based in the in the experience and based in the world. Um, one thing about Mouse that we know is, and Barbara pointed to this with her example from MetaMouse of of Spiegelman's drafts, is it's meticulously researched. And not only did Art Spiegelman um, listen to interview and transcribe his father's own notes about his experience, but he also um, co corroborated all that with actual historical work. So he did just really a decade's worth of, of detailed historical work in Holocaust history in order to match up what his dad was telling him with um, images that he could then gain and, and um, 
recount and reproduce in the comic. Um, let's see. So one thing that comes up in MetaMouse is this wonderful example where Art is asked, um, you know, where did his why mice and where did that come from? Um, and he kind of, you know, sidesteps the question in some ways, but the idea that he likes is connected to this idea, this this business about reducing the complexity of the drawing to really basic gestures, basic sort of gestural um, work work with the pen. Um, and the animal both generalizes and universalizes at the same time. And then just Mouse and Mauschwitz is a pun too good to pass up. And then all of a sudden you get the cats or the Germans and the Poles are pigs and the Americans are dogs, beagles mostly, some uh, hound dog for an African-American man who shows up in Mouse. And um, Spiegelman says in, in one of the interviews that he liked the dog because dogs are mongrels like America. You know, he would maybe use different language than he did in 1990 there. But anyway, he learns after the fact that there was already a mouse in a camp, and that is Mickey Mouse in Gour, the Camp de Gour. And this sent me, as Barbara and I were preparing for this, um, down kind of a rabbit hole um, that was prompted by Barbara Markham following up in some way with a question last week that came to us about what about Mickey Mouse in the camp of Gour? Gour is a a concentration camp in southwestern France, and the first um, substantial deportation of Jew Jewish Germans from the from German territory, and in this case in Baden and Baden-Württemberg um, and the Palatinate, the Pfalz, in southwestern Germany, happened in October 1940. Um, so. Already, you know, the war had started and, and the Holocaust was well underway um, in the East and in Poland, mainly through um, SS Einsatzgruppen, so sort of special troops, and the army using guns to kill people, to kill Jews in, in Poland. But in Germany itself, nothing had really happened until 1940, and there's this first, first mass deportation um, from southwest Germany, and all those people go to this camp in now Vichy, France, called Gour, which is at the foothills of the Pyrenees in far southwest France. And one of the people held there is um, this man Rosenthal, who does a comic book and includes a photograph. This is from 1942. Um, that led me further down another rabbit hole onto um, the track of some of my own scholarly work right now dealing with an expansive German-Jewish family archive. And one of the main figures in that family is Max Mühlfelder, who was deported from Mannheim in October 1940 to Gour and was there for almost a year and a half and then was deported to Drancy, a transit camp in Paris, and from there was sent to Auschwitz and was murdered in Auschwitz. And so as Barbara and I are thinking about teaching mouse and Barbara Markham says, tell me about this Gour comic. Can you find it? Um, these connections happened for me in my mind that the victim that I'm studying in my archive project with students and with the, the Mulfelder Milford family, which if you're really curious, you can go to my webpage, scottdenham.net, and there's a link to that project there. Um, that brings home this fundamental point is that Vladek is not a mouse. Max Mulfelder, who was murdered in the family story, is not a mouse. Max Mulfelder um, was married to Tony, and they have a son. Max Mulfelder, like all good Germans, was a soldier in World War One, And Max Mulfelder has a series of letters you can see in the top left um, Max Mulfelder writing from the camp to his son in New York City. His wife and his son escaped, were able to immigrate. And so um, we have extensive historical documentation in one story that I'm learning to tell about this family with my students that reminds, reminds us as teachers 
that Mouse the comic is, as Barbara mentioned, you know, the story of Vladek's trauma and of Anya's trauma and of art trying to make sense of it. This is uh, young Karl Hans who changes his name to Ken in 1944 when he joins the U.S. Army. And I keep these in here in order to remind us of this um, phenomenon of inherited trauma. And does Ken on the right, um, two decades after his immigration as a nine-year-old, um, how is that story like Art's story? And that takes us back to this really um, fundamental page about the structure of narrative and the act of memory and storytelling um, at the beginning of chapter two of book two, uh, where we see all these layers of narrative complexity, where we have Art Spiegelman, the person as an author, drawing himself. So he's he's fictionalized in a way, right? Because he's a cartoon character of himself with the mask on. So he's he's really opening up the 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 kind of the trick of of how this narrative works, what we might call narrative focalization. You know, how are we in his point of view and also outside of his point of view at the same time? And then this really fundamental ethical problem that Barbara mentioned at the beginning, you know, what if, what if your, your family trauma that you're trying to work through on the page and explain to somebody, or to an audience, um, is all of a sudden really successful? Um, notice even these these really um, kind of painful puns, like Mad Magazine style puns, time flies, and then we have little flies zooming around who are flies on on bodies, right? On corpses. And then the final, like the frame Barbara showed earlier with Vladek upper left and lower right, framing the story of the past in Poland, here we have a really bad pun at the top and then a really bad pun at the bottom. All right, Mr. Spiegelman, we're ready to shoot. Um, shoot is, you know, a, 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 a terrible word to use over a pile of murdered people. Um, so that is related to, to one thing that I think um, can be really helpful in in teaching, and Barbara got at this um, already a little bit, but with specifically how to read the page. And I think another sort of teaching tactic, a pedagogical tactic, could be, um, you know, wh who who are these stories for, and who are they from? What's the relationship between the idea of testimony that you might know from something uh, your students might know? You think, well, testimony happens in a court of law that it's somehow true and it's permanent and it becomes part of the historical record. And our job as witnesses is to kind of respect that and judge that. And how, how are these different layers of reading and writing? And then the text and what's outside the text, the text within the two volumes of mass and then all the, the context and the meta mouse information we have and Spiegelman's interviews and this webinar and all the kind of things that surround our readings there. Um, these panels, you know, show, I think, Spiegelman's real, real genius, just this, just brilliance about how he um, shows for us the difficulty of, of his fame and of trying to tell the story now that his public is really, 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 really big, right? I mean, now that he's world famous. Um, we can maybe get to this some, some towards the end after we talk about censorship and the details of McMinn County, but the idea of, of witnessing the trauma of others, what Susan Sontag in one of a book that's really important for me called Regarding the Pain of Others, where she, she looks very carefully at photographs of war and photographs of trauma, um, says that in a way our, our obligation as a viewer is to is to be witnesses to other people's pain, and if we can see Spiegelman's comic as 
an example of that, what other kinds of examples of witnessing other people's other people's pain and trauma um, can we imagine? And we know, you know, in the American context, there's all kinds of examples, big fat historical ones like the 1619 Project, for example. And then the question is, you know, are those also inherited inherited traumas for people? And you know, I would I would argue very much so. And that's a very fruitful and maybe you know a difficult um, a difficult uh, topic for students to to do these sort of big comparisons. But I think one that's really really fruitful. Um, let's see. And now you know his his um, backing off. He's you know actually I have a real life. I'm going to be a dad. <laughs> um, and he mentions this in the the brief interview that we we showed you there too. So another another point I think that's relevant is not only the idea alongside inherited trauma and post memory or generational memory, where a, a grand grandkids generation has some kind of um, difficulty or problem or um, trauma that they get either from the silence or the stories of their ancestors, and then what is that in a public way? How are those how are those stories made public, and are is there such a thing as collective? Those are difficult, and there's a difficult questions. There's some um, some things in the further readings that we've given you that thinks about that um, in in bigger ways, and these are some some folks that I have learned from. Um, who are good to read. So I think maybe we'll stop right now there for questions, and Barbara, you can come back in and talk about censorship, and then we can go to McMinn County. Thanks, uh, Professor. And I've got a couple of questions I'd like to bring forward um, and invite either of you to comment, or perhaps even both of you to comment. Um, this first question comes from Claire. Claire is from uh, Central Virginia, and Claire is curious about the uh, the contemporary context of Mouse, and I think what she means is this: Mouse was first published in 1973. You know, the world was a particular context in the 1970s, 80s, in the early 1990s when I stood in front of my first class as a teacher and had Mouse on the shelf in the 2000s. How has uh, the, the ways that Mouse has been either used or, or, or accepted or reviewed changed over time? And in particular, how was it accepted when it was first published? Let's see, I'll start with that, and then Barbara can probably fill in all the, the blank spots. And I would say, from my my teaching of mouse is very standard in a course that I call the Holocaust and Representation. So here, this is an upper-level course that's in the History Department and in the German Studies Department at Davidson. And I spend half the class doing a really intense history of the Holocaust, and the second half of the class are representations of that that include life writing like mouse which is the primary example um, memorials art poetry lots of lots of different things that are not history but that are you know representations of this historical experience and so in my generation i started teaching here in 1990 um, right about the time that spiegelman's mouse was getting you know known and important i would say by second iteration of that seminar in 1996 this was standard you know front and center part of any good holocaust lit or representations of the holocaust course before that you know it wasn't really on my radar it was not part of my graduate school training um um but i you know wasn't really part of my my what i was paying attention to as a graduate mm -hmm. student in the 1980s um but Barbara, you probably have a different story on that. I think you know one of the things that's um, that's kind of interesting about uh, graphic novels and comics and their publishing history is that it is kind of hard to point to a date when they were first published, quote unquote. So if you look at the beginning, if you look at the beginning of the first volume of Mouse, you do see 1973 there, but but the book didn't really appear in the form that, that won the Pulitzer Prize until 1986. 
And so, you know, and in the 70s and in the early 80s even, to the degree that pieces of it appeared, that Prisoner from Hell Planet, or there's another kind of longer, um, you know, sort of version where he's trying out um, the sort of, the, he's experimenting with the mouse form, the form of the mice. And so in the very early versions, they're not wearing masks. They actually are fully mice. Uh, you know, so we have like a couple of, of examples of that in the early 70s and early 80s, but they're in these um, kind of underground and, you know, not, they're, they're in these forums that are not really distributed. I mean, he's, you know, Mouse is now published by Pantheon and Penguin, and it's like the biggest publishing conglomerate on the planet. I know I had to actually ask them for permission to publish some of uh, Spiegelman's images in, in my book, you know, so it's it's like he's come from the margins to the center, I would say, is the, the big journey that Mouse has taken. Um, but I will say, you know, and I just taught him uh, just I'm just this semester teaching him again in, a, in a, a course on the Jewish graphic novel, and there are a lot of students who had never heard of it, and they encounter it fresh, and, and you can encounter it now in relation to to other media, right? To to to, to film, and um, and to museums. You know, you could sort of see, I think, the influence of Mouse when you walk into Holocaust museums now. It's almost as if curators have learned what is possible in the space of a museum from what Spiegelman did on the space of the comics page. It's kind of remarkable. Thank you, and I appreciate both of you giving those kinds of um, uh, personal reflections and sort of structuring that time, uh, particularly in your own world. Um, I wonder if you can comment a little bit on the ways that it was accepted more broadly, too. Um, was there ever a time where there was this immediate, I mean, we've got the screen, uh, the, the slide on the screen right now about being banned. Was this an issue? Was this a concern early or in the first part of of mouse being a part of our uh, popular culture? No, I, no. Yeah. I would no, say not it. banned. <laughs> I would say not it's not banned, banned for con. Right. <laughs> right. Good. 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 Um, well, um, I, as the I would say the idea that you know comics were marginal is different from being banned, right? There's all kinds of art that is on the margins yeah. that you know teachers and students and readers and folks bring to the center, but um, an ideologically, politically motivated ban was was new for Mouse uh, this year, 2022. That makes a lot of sense. I, um, I, I will uh, say, I, I want to add one thing about the reception um, of Mouse, and those of you who have, we can maybe just go back to the slide of the cover. This is kind of a, just a sort of a, a fact, a fun fact about Mouse. So the cover, um, Mouse has been published in dozens of languages. I don't even, I don't even, scores of languages. Somebody can yeah. probably Google and find out exactly how many. But the only, um, and, and the, the cover appears in some version uh, similar in every language. The only place where it does not appear with the swastika is in Germany because it's against the law to include, um, you know, the swastika. There's, they have laws, prohibitions about, you know, using certain kinds of material in the public sphere. So, you know, this sort of this general problem of, uh, of, of, of a, a topic as, as weighty and as important and as central as the Holocaust um, being, you know, sort of delivered in this form, which is, you know, sort of considered lowbrow, I think people kind of got over it pretty quickly. Mm, um, yeah. Because because the book was just such a, a you know it's it's as you know such an outstanding work of art, and so yeah. the artistry was just sort of you know immediately um, I think evident to people. Great. Well, we have about twenty minutes left. Why don't we move forward with the the final uh, section of your presentation tonight, and we'll take some questions at the end. Okay. Okay. So, Go for it, Scott. Let's see. Maybe start? I'm gonna I'm gonna move ahead. I think to the my story about um, McMinn County really quickly, and just we can just leave Go this slide it. up. So, so in January, on January 27th, the local journalist in Tennessee. This is all in our our materials for you um, in the resource library. 
broke a story that was the, about a local school board in McMinn County, Tennessee, who banned this book. Um, they said they didn't ban it later, that they just removed it from the curriculum. Therefore, it was still available for students to read, whatever. Um, his story was picked up um, in the Twitter sphere and then retweeted by Gaiman, who has 3 million followers. And then the next day it was in the national press. And I had seen this that night, and in a fit of kind of like righteous anger, <laughs> I built a free online course for students in McMinn County and contacted um, school people there in the local public library. And that then became part of the press immediately in the, the days following in early February. Um, and so that, you can see the front side of that course is also listed in our our uh, materials for tonight. And I kept all the backside private just for the students and a couple of parents who joined in. And Barbara came to one of those meetings towards the end. Um, and that was a really beautiful little space, but it also got press. It was first in Inside Higher Ed, which is a kind of internal um, news magazine, you know, new web, web news thing for college higher ed people, and then got picked up in various press. Um, and then I paid really close attention to the discourse in McMinn County and the there are sort of two interpretations of why Mouse got banned in McMinn County. And they both lead to what I would call far right Christian nationalism. Um, thank you for bringing those slides up there. Um, one argument that I would put forward is that to ban uh, mouse is to excise the teaching of the Holocaust, which I think is an anti an act of anti-Semitism because it um, it takes away that part of human experience. And we know from all the different kinds of anti-Semitism um, that are out in the world that minimizing the suffering of Jewish people is a key aspect of that. So to erase the story is to erase the victim. So that's one one argument. The second argument, and this comes um, several months later in a really smart um, radio show at, among some local folks in Tennessee, is that it was just a power flex by the local school board against the professional educators, the curriculum committee and the approved curricula options in Tennessee that were researched and chosen by the local curriculum expert and te two teachers in McMinn County. And this was the school board members just pushing back against the experts. And the argument there is local control and parent control. One school board member says at one point that parents had complained. And what I learned from talking with people in McMinn County is that the complaints actually came from a group called Moms for Liberty, um, who are parents, I guess, but not in McMinn County. Um, and that is a, a, a far right group um, that has all the attributes of a kind of highly energized, um, apparently grassroots organization for parental control, but they've, they've got, um, they don't disclose where their funding comes from. And, you know, there's a deep dive in that in the New Yorker magazine this week. Um, so I, that's also linked in our resources. I just put that up yesterday. So that then leads us to think about censorship more broadly. And we can go back a few slides um, and to the point that um, mostly mouse is never censored. You know, what gets censored are dirty words and sexy sex sex. And now um, anything having to do with you know, non-cis, non-straight um, sex is, is now part of part of the banning. Um, what's what's on target? So, mouse in some ways is the except, just the big exception. And the claim among the local school board was that it showed nudity, and that is in the first page of Prisoner on Hell Planet in Volume One, um, page one hundred. And also that it had really hard. <laughs> yeah, we see 
uh, so that you can go there and look. You see Art Spiegelman's mother's breast from a distance outside as she is dying in the bathtub. And then they also say that they banned some bad words. Um, and the, there's a long, a long section in the school board meeting transcript where they talk about whiting out the bad words in like all you know 200 copies of the book or whatever, which is just an exercise in silliness because the school board then tables the motion and then re brings the motion back in and just bans it 10 to zero flat out. I read all that as um, you know a, a motive uh, to to ban the book for for broader reasons that have to do with authoritarian thinking and uh, white Christian nationalism and what Timothy Snyder would call fascism. So both of my both of the sort of my reads on this argument, which are certainly debatable, are that it's anti-Semitic in and of itself because it erases the Holocaust from the curriculum and that it is part of the broader far-right um, white Christian nationalist project. So now let's go on to other kinds of banning. Barbara. Well, I mean, you know, what else is there to say, honestly? I mean, we could go to write, we could go to the Why Teach Now place. I'm just, again, sort of mindful of the time, and I would really like to hear from from. Andy, would that be okay if there are people who have taught math? I mean, we can. Well, well, we can, Barbara. Uh, although we were not going to be able to hear their voices, so if you'd like okay, to. Okay, that's ask right. A... Okay. Right. I can just put up a couple of these slides. I would, I would urge, you know, if if no one, if you're, you know, the Penn website has tremendous resources, and they're really kind of tracking, um, they're, they're tracking what's going on. And they offer, again, a kind of a very broad um, definition. Pen America defines a school book ban as any action taken against a book um, based on its content and as a result of parent or community challenges, administrative decisions, or in response to direct or threat. I mean, it's pretty thorough, right? And um, in that New Yorker article, actually, you know, you get a sense, and the teachers on this this webinar know this well, of how, how thoroughly, you know, material is vetted, you know, the idea that, that these are just books that people want to teach because they want to influence or they want to, you know, corrupt children, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, you know, it's outrageous. Um, and so, I, you know, I think, I think Penn does a really good job of sort of um, channeling that rage and you know, and giving us really a sense of of where these things are happening. And again, the the sort of the predominant you know the subject matter again is 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 books connected to to race, to history, history about race, racial relations, um, and and anything having to do with sex and gender. And way down at the other end here is is books having sort of overtly religious content. So. Mouse is, is sort of, you know, as, as Scott explained, it's, it's kind of um, the reasons that were given would have to do with sort of language and nudity, but they're, but they're so far-fetched and they're so minuscule and, with, again, within this sort of this wider context of um, thinking about a version of history which is sanitized and which is conflict-free. Um, think of some of the arguments that were brought against the 1619 Project, um, et cetera. Um, let's pause for a minute. I, there's such a great conversation going on there in the chat. Andy, do you want to bring any of that forward? Well, you know, we can. We've got about 15 minutes also. left. So why, why don't we conclude? Uh, to, let's do your last few slides, and then okay, we'll have great. some minutes at the at the end, and we'll we'll take some questions. So we have just Bef a, a few, one, you know, broad before, questions. Let me yeah, let me um, interject before we get to that. Is that the the outcome of the book banning was that Mouse zoomed to the top of Amazon's list, that it was sold out, that a, a awesome bunch of um, folks at a comic store in Knoxville, Tennessee, called which is the big biggest city near um, Athens, Tennessee, called Nirvana Comics, started a GoFundMe in order to get books in the hands of any any kids in McBen County who wanted it, and their GoFundMe raised over $100,000 in just a couple of days, and they mailed a free copy of The Complete Mouse to any kid who asked for it anywhere in the country. 
Um, so the result of the book ban is really sweet, which is that Mouse became super famous all of a sudden, once again, for a whole new set of readers. Um, and, you know, that's that's natural, I think, for all kinds of materials that, like Art Spiegelman says in his interview, you know, if the grown-ups don't want you to read it, then of course you want to read it. Um, so that's still kind of the only hopeful moment for me in the in where we are right now culturally is that that the kids are all right because they will seek out what makes the grown-ups nervous, and that is a good thing. So I'll I'll just pick up the the last few slides here, um, which we've just we've sort of tried to think about all of the different reasons why we think it's important to teach mouse right now, and I already touched on one of them earlier um, in you know in terms of this idea of of intergenerational trauma or just the idea of trauma more generally in the way that that our students um, have experienced different kinds of trauma in recent years, um, and the other for me as actually with populations overseas even more so um, you know so this the conversation that Scott and I began to have about mouse um, happened you know also in the context of the war in the Ukraine and you know one of the things that the use of animals um, in the book the use of, 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 of mice and um, cats and dogs as Scott was describing earlier you know is that it creates um, a, a little bit of of distance sometimes between um, the reader and these, you know, these truly horrific events that are being described, and and so one of the one of the things that students can learn really is is how easily, you know, with that sort of switch between animals and human, how easily entire populations can become dehumanized, um, and you know, we've seen that, you know, we've seen that in the kind of the language that that Putin has used to describe. Uh, the people of Ukraine and to 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 attack them and to you know to destroy their country and so this I think is uh, you know something that that students the the connections to help students draw those connections and to see where that could lead um, is tremendously important to educate and fight um, you know anti-Semitism to to help our students understand the history of anti-Semitism um, not only in the United States um, but abroad. Um, to, again, to give them the tools to think about where it where it might be present in their own world, and also because it's just an amazing, amazing book, teaching great art, right? Lessons about love and, and loss, joy and pain, to help our students understand and experience empathy. Here we go. Thank you, and that oh, Tim you and know, Tyler, yes. Absolutely. Ahead, in some ways, it isn't isn't that what the humanities do, right? Is is to provide those kinds of uh, the, this kinds of training uh, models for what empathy is. I've got a few questions I'd like to bring to uh, the two of you as we uh, start to wrap up tonight. Um, and the first question is going to come. There's another Dom. We have one from Los Angeles. This one's from Chicago. Um, talk to us a little bit about about how Mouse changed when it won the Pulitzer. Um, you know, it was one thing before, and it can be popular, it can be on shelves, it can be, um, you know, people can know about it, but then it, you win that kind of global prize, and that changes everything. Tell us how people reflected on Mouse after it won this big award. Well, I, I think, you know, the award came pretty early, actually, right? In other words, the award came um, before... It came for volume one, I believe. I need to, to check my facts here. I apologize. But it came relatively early. And so you, you see actually the, 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 perhaps the person who is most affected by um, you know, the, that level of recognition and honor and stature is Spiegelman himself. And he reflects on this in the second book, you know, sort of the effects of that on his practice and how he feels, again, about you know, winning an award for this book about his father's suffering and about his own his own difficulties. So, you know, I think that it, I don't think that there's been a graphic novel that's won the Pulitzer since, um, but it's still, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm thinking here about Bob Dylan winning the Nobel Prize. Like it has that kind of that, that moment where people sort of say, uh, and they, they pay attention um, a little more closely. And you can, you know, you can see, and I see also in the, um, the 92 Pulitzer. So maybe, interesting. Thank you, Scott. 
um, I, what I was going to say is that you know you can see now when when new graphic novels are published, the kind of press they get. Um, if you look and if you read the New York Times in the sort of the back of the book review section, there's a whole separate section now for graphic novels. So I think it kind of elevated. Um, it sort of elevated the genre in a way that had not been possible earlier. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. This question comes from Bernadette. This is a second question from Bernadette. She's, again, in Atlanta, Georgia. And she notices and admits, and, you know, all of us are trying to differentiate and find the appropriate time and place to address these kinds of issues with young people. Uh, she admits that sometimes she's surprised when she hears that Mouse is being taught in a 7th through 10th grade, middle grade, let's say, simply because intergenerational trauma is such an adult concept. It's a big deal. Um, do you have a sense of how to teach the book effectively to young people, maybe middle grades or early high school? I can maybe lead into that and say um... – I I was surprised also I that this was being um a centerpiece of the 8th grade unit on the Holocaust um and Art Spiegelman was certainly surprised at that. On the other hand, he says in a different part of that interview that the kids can handle it, right? That that people will read at whatever level they're ready to read at and I think for us you know, for you all, especially as teachers, the kind of close reading that Barbara demonstrated, um, anybody can do, right? Any any reader, middle school reader, can look really closely and and extract meaning and knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, giving some broad framework, like, you know, the Holocaust is big and complicated, um, that... Vladek's story is more typical than many because it's situated in Poland, which is where most of the Holocaust happened, where most Jews were murdered. Um, but Vladek's story is also not normal because he survives to tell it, and most people didn't, right? So those kinds of big, big, just historical kind of marking points, I think, could be really important for students to understand. And then, you know, what we were sort of gesturing towards um, at the beginning is is how does the our sort of empathy for Vladek's and Art's suffering help us understand the suffering of other people today? So that might be a way for for teaching, you know, not just what happens in the Holocaust, but what is our role as as witnesses? You know, are we called to act right. in some way or to feel and think in some way? Right. That's a great uh, that's a great reflection. Thank you, Scott. Um, this question comes from Lois. Lois in, is in Grants Pass, Oregon, down the lower southwestern corner of Oregon, not too far from the coast. Um, again, this is to either of you. Do you have any wisdom or any suggestions of how to of how to demystify this work? Um, are there are there myths about it? Are there are there misperceptions? Are there are, are there assumptions that people make that just and when I say people, I mean it very broadly. People make when they enter this kind of content or this kind of genre that uh, is difficult. What what would you suggest to our audience that they unteach? I, I could I could say a little bit about that. Um, I think it is. Um, as I said earlier, like just to underline for students that because something is is a comic and because it's you know sort of using mice and instead of people, right, it has these kind of playful, ostensibly playful, formal features um, that it that it that it has that it can't have some sort of truth, right? That it that it can't be important, that it can't tell a story. Um, you know, it's, oh, I see another question about complex histories and conservative politicians. Scott, you're going to take that one. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would just trust students to get it, you know, and to sort of just be kind of, you know, present with them as they read, you know, using, again, 
that kind of close reading of the page, I think it helps students begin to sort of unlock the, the way that, 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 that comics work. And once they have those, those tools, once you sort of show them how it works on a page or two, they'll just run with it. That's a great point. Thank right. you. Um, um, so I, 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 I was going to get to this, this fundamental question about, you know, if, if you are whatever, a white person, and therefore you feel guilty, and how kind of silly that idea is. Um, and there's a, an important speech that I'll put, I'll add to our resource, the resource library, a speech from 1985 by the German president, Richard von Weizsäcker, where he very carefully delineates between personal responsibility uh, personal guilt and collective responsibility. And he says, you know, people are guilty who have perpetrated acts, and that's between them and their maker or their conscience. But he says, as Germans, we have a responsibility to know history and act in the presence of that history responsibly. And so I think to the conservative politicians say, well, of course, you know, you or this this person is not responsible for actions in the past, but and you know, there's no guilt to be had there. We are, however, raising children and teaching teaching our you know teaching to to know history in order to be able to make responsible decisions based on that knowledge. So the the a, a kind of handy counter to that um, that reactionary or you know far right ideological perspective to say, well, what's what's the difference between guilt? which is a, a, a personal um, result of an unjust act and the responsibility to, to be uh, an educated citizen and act in the world in responsible ways. Great, thank you. Uh, we just have a few more minutes. I've got two more questions for you. Uh, again, this can go to either of you. This next to last question, this on deck question comes from Monica. Monica's in Durham, North Carolina. And she wonders, um, pedagogically, maybe technically, maybe in terms of uh, the, the being authentic, the material, have either of you or would either of you suggest that you teach mouse in with excerpts? Do you have to read the whole thing or can there be uh, certain passages, certain pages, certain elements uh, pulled out and used uh, in, in your teaching? You know, I am, I I'm not a fan of excerpts. Yeah, just teach it. It's a very immersive. It's very immersive. Yeah. And I think, you know, I actually have tried to sometimes just teach volume one. But, you know, uh, just just give it to them. It's immersive and it reads very quickly. And then students feel proud that they read all of Mouse. You know, it's they experience it. Um, I think... I think that's, you know, that's a very valuable thing to not, I, I can't yeah. be in your classroom, so I can't say what else is going on, but I would just go for it, teach the whole thing. Yeah, thank you. That's a very strong uh, advocate, and I appreciate you being uh, being direct about that. Um, we just have a couple of more minutes. Professor Mann, I'm going to ask this question of you first, and uh, Scott, I, you get a little bit of time to think about this. Um, Professor Mann, here's my last question for you before we conclude tonight. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here are I you <laughs> are you optimistic? Yeah, when I when I talk, when I teach, I am. <laughs> when That's I a teach, great answer. Um, you know, when I teach, I'm optimistic. My students um, give me a lot of strength, um, and and being on this this webinar this evening also, and just you know, sort of seeing. The conversation uh, between all the all the folks on the webinar and Andrew, mm. you know, your wonderful hosting. I have to be optimistic. I don't really have a choice. You know, I'm a yeah. parent. I'm a teacher. What else? It, and isn't in some ways yeah, absolutely that's right. <laughs> and and isn't in some ways that's the sort of the 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 delicate line of art reflecting tragedy is that at its heart it is optimistic. Professor Denham, are you I, optimistic? I'm going to have to say I'm not right now. I mean, I I get, you know, I get it and I'm a teacher and a parent too and you know, I do that pedagogical work and it it's um 
you know, it is inherently optimistic to be in the classroom yeah. with young yeah. people by yeah. just by definition. Um, but, you know, when I have spent whatever, 40 years studying the structures of fascism, I see them all around us right now. And, um, you know, we're going to have to be fighter teachers and really yeah. wield, the, wield the pen and wield the word um, in, in ways that are are more aggressive and more more assertive and going to have to lead lead our children and our students to really think on their own and um so which is to say of course i'm optimistic but <laughs> uh, <laughs> but when when so, i see when i see history you know the lessons are chilling so we got to we got to keep keep doing this good work all you colleagues out there thank you absolutely thank Thank you. And in some ways, I think that the two of you just answered the central and essential question for tonight, why teaching mouse matters now more than ever. I want to thank both of you for uh, joining us tonight, Professor Barbara Mann, Professor Scott Denham. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing this narrative. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Barbara. It's been great getting to know you. Maybe we'll have coffee Face to face sometime. It's going to happen. Uh, it's definitely going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You all be in touch and we'll, we'll, uh, take care. Uh, Reach spike, out. Good luck out spike there. Like the library with some more things. Yeah. Good luck. Do be good work. Be safe out there. Thanks. Everybody. And, and my final thanks, of course, will go to our audience for joining us tonight. If you are interested in using graphic novels in your classroom, I do invite you to go to the Humanities and Class Digital Library and type in the keyword graphic novels. You'll come up with 32 resources that includes this past webinar with Trevor Getz from San Francisco State University on ways to teach the humanities using graphic novels, uh, histories. You'll also find um, work from Jesse Constantino from the University of New Mexico, from Ari Kelman, uh, University of California at Davis, and uh, others who have also used uh, Marianne Rett, who is or uh, use graphic novels in teaching Islamic culture, please do uh, use our resource library to find other ways to explore graphic novels with your students. Please also follow our social media feeds for upcoming opportunities and activities at the National Humanities Center. That includes our next webinar. That'll be next week, November the 8th. I'll be joined by Kara Vuick from Texas Christian University. She'll be sharing her work on women, American women in World War II. Hey folks, don't forget, and I mean this quite literally and quite sincerely, make sure you vote. Next time we see each other and work with each other will be after election day. No, it'll be on election day. Vote before you come to our webinar, make sure you vote, uh, and we're hopeful that, um, that you cast your voice in any way that you can. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day at school tomorrow, a great weekend. We'll see you next time on the Humanities in Class webinar 